Hello! It's been a while since I made an update on my Pewdie One Breadboard TTL CPU. Since my last update, I've gotten sidetracked by a few other projects, notably refurbishing my childhood teammate game computer and updating my house to be a smart house. I also spent some time building and hacking with the MCS 85 Plus single board computer based on the Intel 8085 CPU. This retro computer was designed by the YouTuber Hello World. This computer will be a part of the promised follow on to my advanced ALU video where I go into the details of doing 64 bit math on an 8 bit computer. But that's not what this video is about. Now, when I was programming on the MCS 85 Plus, the 8085 instruction set had a feature that was similar to my experience with the Z80 instruction set. Specifically, the ability to save and restore the flag register. In both CPUs, we, you are able to push the A and F register values onto the stack and then restore the values by popping the stack back into the registers. Using this sort of feature again made me realize that the design I put together for the advanced ALU in my last video on the PewD1 was insufficient. You see, I did add the ability to read the flag register's content to the data bus and thus be able to save the values of the flag register. However, I did not implement the ability to set the flag register content from the data bus, and thus my design is insufficient to be able to implement a similar set of features in the PewD1 instruction set. To understand the issues, let's take a look at the schematic from the advanced ALU video, and you can see the problem. I implemented a connection from this 74LS173 that constitutes the flag register to the data bus via this 74LS245 bus transceiver. However, the only input to the flag registers come from this ATF22V10 programmable logic device. This programmable logic device presents an opportunity for creating a data bus input to the flag register without the need of adding any new chips to the board. Recall the reason I used the programmable logic device was to minimize the number of chips required to affect the logic needed to arbitrate which of these flag state input lines would be allowed to write to the flags register. Being able to allow the data bus to write to the flag registers requires just another input to arbitrate. So how would we do this? Since the PewD1 has only four flag bits, we only need to read from four of the data bus lines. Furthermore, we would need a control signal from the control logic to signal the flags in operation. So, we would need a total of five more inputs to this programmable logic device. Serendipitously, there are five open input lines on this device. Honestly, I didn't plan that in my last video, but I will take advantage of the open lines here. So, let's update the design. Here is the updated schematic for the flags register. You can see here, that not much has changed except for the bottom four bits of the data bus are now connected to the ATF22V10. And there is a flags in control line also connected to the ATF22V10. Note that the data bus connection into the programmable logic device only attaches the bottom four bits of the data bus. This means that when writing to the flags register, the top four bits are simply ignored. Obstensively, they should be zero. But the way this is wired, it doesn't really matter what value they are. This is a real simple change. So let's take a look at how the ATF22V10 programmable logic is going to be changed. Here is the POD logic for the flags register controller. You will note that the pin definitions have five new pins defined here. The four bus inputs and then the flags in input. The logic change is pretty simple. If the flags in control line is low, as indicated by a forward slash in front of the flags in symbol, then all the original control logic I have for arbitrating the flag status input can be applied. You can see that due to the limitation of the PLD syntax, I had to add this not flags in symbol to every term that was in the original logic, as you can see here. Now, when the flags in control line is high, as indicated by a flags in symbol without the forward slash, then the bus input lines can be carried forward to the output, as seen in these, this line, this line, this line, and this line. You can see that each of the bus bit positions correspond to a specific flag bit, as indicated by these symbols here. 
I made the bit arrangement of the bus input match the bit arrangement of the 74LS173 bits of the flag register. And that's it. Like the schematic change, this PLD logic change is pretty simple and straightforward. Now let's get this wired up. Okay, here is my PewDie 1 TTL CPU without the changes that we just described. If you look closely, this is where the flags register is. This is the ATF22V10 programmable logic device. This is where the bus comes out from the 74LS245 bus transceiver that you saw in the schematic. So let's zoom in and take a closer look. Here is a detailed view of the flags register. Right here, you actually see the five unused lines for the ATF22V10. I have them pulled low right now because they're not being used, and it's just generally best practice to pull unused inputs to chips low. Here is the 74LS245 bus transceiver that outputs the flag register to the data bus. So you can see what I need to do. I need to connect the lower four bits of the data bus here to the 22V10C and then bring in a flags in control line so that I can single the flags in operation. So I'm going to do this wiring off camera. I'll get it done and be right back. And here is the updated wiring. As you can see, it was pretty straightforward. Like I said, just adding the four bus line connections for the four lower bits of the data bus and adding a new control line. The next thing I need to do is reprogram the ATF22V10 with the updated logic so these new input pins can be used. Now we put the ATF22V10C into the programmer. I've already compiled the POD logic into a JEDEC file, as you can see in this directory here. So the only thing left to do is to run Minipro and program the ATF22V10C. There, it's programmed. Now let's go put it back into the breadboard and see if this works. Here is some simple test code I wrote to test the new ability to write to the flags register. The way this code works is pretty straightforward. It's just going to demonstrate that I can update the flags register on demand. To demonstrate this, first it's going to clear the flags register and print its current content. Then I'm going to do some math that causes a carry, and then I'll print the flags register content again. Again, this printing will actually go to the LCD screen. Then I'm going to push the flags register value as it was after the math onto the stack, then clear the flags register and print the contents again just to demonstrate that it was cleared. I'm going to pop the flags back from the stack on into the flags register and then print the flags register content again to show that it was changed. I'm going to set the flags register value so that oh, I have a spelling error. I'm going to set the flag register value so that only the equal flag is set and demonstrate branching based on that setting. And then, then I'm done. And that will be the demonstration. Here is the code that I wrote to do all that. I outlined it with these labels to kind of show which step is which. Let's go get this compiled and then uh, run the code. Now, let's run the demonstration code to see if it all works. First, I've got to put the programmable ATF22V10C back in place. I burned the demonstration program onto this EEPROM, so I need to replace the Prime's EEPROM I was running. Now, let's t turn it on and see if it works. Well, that's not quite what I expected. Okay, I found the bug in my code and I've reprogrammed the EEPROM. Uh, the bug was a silly typo, too silly to go over here. So let's turn this back on and see if it works. Yeah, that's much better. It's kind of what I expected. Huh. Looks like I have a problem. So let's, uh, let me rerun this and I'm going to zoom in on the LCD screen so you can see what's going on and I will control the clock with my manual clock switch here. Okay, I'm going to stop the clock and reset. Now, when I run this again, I'm going to stop at each 
stage of it, kind of explain what's going on, and then show you the problem. So here we are at the start of the program. The first thing we're going to do is clear the flag bits. And here I print out the contents of the flag register. I print out all eight bits. So I would expect the top four bits here to always be zero. And so it's the bottom four bits that really are of interest here. So let's go to the next step. So I add two numbers, hex EE plus hex 42. And I would expect that to have a carry. So you can see here the carry bit is set. That is the carry bit, the second, or bit one with the zero based indexing. So that's what I would expect. The next step is I set the flag register to zero, clearing it out. And as you can see, when I print out the flag bits, everything's zero as expected. Now, if you remember from the code, before I cleared the flag bits, I actually pushed the flag register contents onto the stack. So right now, the flag register contents are saved in the stack. Let's go to the next stage. Now, I pop the flag the stack back into the flag register, and you see the flag bits here are now different than what they were before. So what they were before was the carry bit was set, and the carry bit is bit one, not bit zero. So something got transposed. So I'm gonna have to investigate to figure out what that is. So I found the problem, but it, it wasn't a problem with my wiring, and nothing got transposed. It was actually a problem with my code once again. But this one was interesting, and it kind of gets to the point of why I am implementing this ability to save the flags register. So if you look at my code, here is step four. This is the step that actually prints the contents of the flag register after I clear it. Uh, step three is when I clear it. Step four is when I pop it back and pop the value back into the flags register and then print it. Now, if you look at the sequence of these events, here is step two. Here's where I do the addition of two values that I expect to be a carry. Here's where I print the flag register. And as you recall from what I just showed you, this gets printed correctly. The correct bit in the flag register actually gets set. Then I would run this delay. And what this delay does is just for aesthetic reasons, it slows down the scrolling of the lines uh, so that you can actually see what's going on. And that's all that does. After the delay, I push the flags register to save it. And then I put the next step message, which is the message that says I'm gonna be clearing the flags register. Here is where I clear the flags register by moving a value of zero into the flags register. And then I print the contents. So. The bug is there if you don't readily see it. And this gets into side effects. What are the side effects of something that you're doing? So the side effect of interest here is this call to delay 16. What this does is takes the value that I pushed onto the stack, um, which is this constant here, which is set to, what is it set to? Set to FF, FF, and hex. So it takes that and it counts down. So let's take a look at that and kind of see what's going on in this function. So here's the delay 16. What it does is it saves the HL register and then it takes the value that was passed on the stack and puts it into HL. And then it just loops through decrementing HL until HL gets to zero and then it returns. Now, if you don't see the bug here, or really it's not a bug, it's really an unintended side effect. And if you don't see it yet, let me explain. So what I'm doing is I'm doing a math operation right here, which is decrement HL. And waiting until the value of HL gets to zero, which would then set the zero flag and allow me to fall through. And so if you recall from what was being displayed in the prior test, when I was coming back from this function, specifically when I am right here in step four, I was getting bit zero set rather than bit one set. Bit zero is the zero flag, bit one is the carry flag. So here's the bug if you don't readily see it. Since I'm calling this delay 16, by the, when I return from this delay 16, the flag register has been modified. At this point, the zero flag in the flag register is what should be set. But after I call that function, where I expect a zero flag to be set, that's when I push the flags register onto the stack. 
So what I'm actually saving is the flag register content of the results of calling delay 16 rather than the flag register content from this math operation here, which should be the carry flag. Now this gets into a programming style consideration. Should these functions have side effects? One approach is to actually make these functions such that they don't have side effects. Since I know this decrement instruction is going to alter the flags register, one thing I could do is actually make it such that when I enter this function, I actually save the flags register and restore it when I leave so that when I leave this delay 16 function, all registers have been restored to the original value that they had when we enter. Now you can see I'm already doing that with the HL register. I am preserving the HL register value by pushing the original value onto the stack and then popping it back in place before I return. So to fix this, let's actually do the same thing for the flags register. So I'm going to do that first. And then pop the flags register. Now, since I'm pushing another thing on the stack, uh, this value here is going to be offset by one more rather than two. It's going to be offset by three. So I'll add it there. And I believe that should actually fix the bug. So let me go compile this and reburn the EEPROM and test this out again. Okay, I have compiled the program once again with Bespoke ASM. I have burned the EEPROM. Let's turn this on and uh, see what happens. So the, let the clock go. Okay, as before, the first stage is to clear the flag bits, and you can see that happen just fine. Then the second stage is to add two numbers, and the carry bit gets set. The third stage is to clear it again. Now remember, this is where the saving of the flag register occurred. Uh, I didn't change the code that saved the flag register after the call to the delay function because I wanted to demonstrate that I made the delay function have no side effects by actually saving the flag register when I entered the delay function. Now you may argue I really should save before the delay function, but this just tests it out a little bit better. So. Let's go to the next stage to see if we made it work. There you go. The carry bit is what is set rather than the zero flag. That means that delay function no longer has a side effect and the original flag register value, which was the carry bit being set, was restored. So success. And then this last stage was just some other test code to test branching based on the flag register value that was manually set rather than set by some kind of operation. In this case, I set the equal flag, which is bit 3, and then did branching based off of that. So here, I have uh, set the equal flag to 1, and let's just see if the branching occurred as expected. Yep, the branching occurred as expected. So there we go. I have demonstrated that my flag register now works. I can set it in addition to reading it. And now I have an architecture that is reminiscent of both the Intel 8085 and the Z80, like I described earlier in this video. Well, that's it. Like I said, this was going to be a short video. The eagle-eyed amongst you might notice that I've placed some chips down here in the lower right side of the board. This is another project that I'm not quite done with yet. I'll be talking about it in a future video. So that's it for now. Thanks for watching. If you found this video enjoyable and informative, please do like it and subscribe to my channel. Until next time, goodbye.